Yes, my liberal mama helped in many ways to confirm my conservatism. You'll be glad to learn that at least my grandmother, never granny, was not a liberal. She was a short, red-haired, belligerent, and very gay little Irish woman who, when necessary, was tight with a quid, not tobacco dears, but could be lavish at times and would slip a small girl a sovereign on her birthday with a wise admonishment. And you'll not be telling your dada or mum if you're sensible. And back then, by the way, gay meant happy, carefree, not the way it means now, which is homo. She was not homo, no, obviously. I was always sensible on those occasions. Grandmother had a low opinion of her offspring, all four of them, and their wives. If she had a favorite, it was I who was named after her. I loved her conversation, and she would always listen to me. So one day, when I was visiting in her visiting her in Leeds, I told her about those accursed buttons and Mama's coat and R. Agnes. Never trust anyone who weeps for the poor, said Grandmother, unless they're poor themselves. I found that a sound rule of thumb to this very day. This does not mean I'm against the poor and never help them. I do, but first I make sure they want to help themselves, and I don't weep over them. Good, good advice from Taylor Caldwell's grandmama. Never weep for the poor. Never trust anyone who weeps for the poor, rather. Never trust anyone who weeps for the poor unless they're poor themselves. In the course of my own charity work, I've had many occasions to witness the accuracy of grandmother's advice. And I've noticed that more and more even the richest and most tearful liberals are refusing to give to charity as a matter of principle, they claim. Such Mr. Buttonses now declare that charity is degrading to the poor. They weep that it should all be done through government so the poor can keep their self-respect. Government charity, of course, at the expense of the industrious and the taxpaying, isn't charity at all to the Mr. Buttons. Mr. Buttons is, I should say. It is only what they deserve. This is known as acrobatic logic. It is always mixed with tearful shrieks about the underprivileged, disadvantaged, and culturally deprived. It's dangerous nonsense, as Grandmother knew. Why did sepulchers? Now, this other stuff happened... Um, let's see. She didn't specify what her age was when her mama beat her for suggesting that she give her old coat to the poor cleaning woman who didn't even have a coat. Mm. Let's see. The uncle and aunt, she didn't cite an age either. So let's go on with this. When I was six, just before we came to America, so this was obviously before she was six when this other stuff happened, uh, I had another experience with yet another ghastly liberal relative whose eyes were always moist with so-called love. Now, I say so-called. She didn't write that. Love is in quotation marks. This means the same thing as so-called or supposed to be. This one loved everyone. She admitted it herself regularly and then would look about at others' presence with a yearning expression waiting for applause. As they were mostly of her ilk, they gave her that applause and the ladies would tenderly wipe their own eyes with a scented handkerchief as if moved to their very hard and inflexible hearts. But somehow at six and experienced, I doubted this one's sanctity and love for her fellows. Yet on one occasion, she fooled me badly. I was visiting this particular auntie who had only one good thing going for her. She employed a talented a talented cook. And Mama was a foul cook, and so were the hapless creatures who cooked for her. Auntie's cook could make lemon cheese tarts as no one else could, so I often dropped in to visit on Thursdays on the way home from Miss Brother's Emporium of Learning to sample those tarts. Liberal auntie, for some reason, had taken a dislike to me considering me rather cold, rather cold is capitalized, and she suspected the reasons for my visits, but she had the British tradition for hosp hospitality to maintain. So she let me devour her delicious tarts, in the meanwhile inflicting little liberal homilies on me in order, as she said, to soften my childish heart. I rarely listened, 
I was too absorbed with dainties and hot tea. But I had an experience one Thursday afternoon at school which rankled. Our physician's son, Tommy, was a pure stinker. His father belonged to the Liberal Party in Manchester and so always spoke piously and earnestly, though I doubt he ever visited the poor for free. Tommy had inherited his father's nefarious traits. He was insultingly polite to Miss Brothers and allowed she was genteel, but wasn't it a pity that she's poor and had to use her father's house as a private school? The sentiment was excellent, considering that, that Miss Brothers was not exactly rich. But Tommy's tone of voice crawled under my skin. It was condescending, patronizing. You don't feel for Miss Brothers at all, I informed Tommy that fateful afternoon. Nick, neither does your papa. Miss Brothers called for him yesterday for her mama, who's an invalid upstairs. And when he came down, he held out his hand to Miss Brothers and said, Well, miss, this will be a pound, please. A pound is kind of like a dollar. That's what you could compare it to. A pound is a dollar, sort of. I don't know what the exchange rate is now. And you know a pound is not a lot of money, and a pound is all she gets for each of us a week, which includes our tea. There were seven of us little monsters, and Miss Brother's father had fallen on evil days, and she had to support both parents. Moving on along. Tommy was outraged. He clenched his fist and went for me. We were the same age, but I was inspired with contempt, and contempt is always a handy weapon to have about one. So I swung hard at Tommy and beat him up soundly. And I tell you, children, there's something about swinging at a liberal that gives me enormous pleasure. At any rate, I also blacked his eye. That ought to have satisfied me, but I have the cold, lasting anger of the Irish that is in me. So I told sweet auntie with the tarts of my collision with Tommy. I expected a little understanding at least. I should have known better. Good liberal that she was, auntie was appalled. She lifted her big, meaty hands heavenward and rolled her eyes and opened her mouth. How cruel, 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 she exclaimed. You don't love your fellow man, Janet. There is no love in your heart. Not for Tommy, I said. I was puzzled. I had thought she would sympathize with the har harassed Mrs. Brothers, or Miss Brothers, rather. But you know God wants you to love everybody, said dear liberal auntie, and a tear appeared in the corner of her false eyes. Then he isn't very clever, I said. Now, Auntie was certain that not only was I cruel and without love, but my soul was lost in the bargain. She began to plead with me. She curled her right hand with tender, loving care at me, her fingers softly bent. Her eyes, very wet at this point, trembled, and so did her mouth. She cocked her head. She smiled beseechingly. She said, Dear little child, you know you were wrong, don't you? Of course you do. There's really some good in that hard little heart, isn't there? Confess, sweetheart, you were wrong to treat poor Tommy that way, weren't you? The whole picture of Auntie was very touching, her tears beguiling, her entire attitude full of exquisite pleading. A little feather of cold doubt fluttered, fluttered on my heart, a feeling of shame. I didn't want Auntie to suffer like this. After all, she was generous with the tarts. I was sorry that I had wounded her, though I still hated Tommy. So I said, so I told a falsehood. I said, yes, I was wrong. I despised myself for that lie. I repeated so that she would stop that coy weeping. Yes, I was wrong. I should have known. Auntie's face immediately changed. Her pale blue eyes became the dead eyes of a codfish, glaucous and terrible. She sprang to her feet and literally fell upon me, flailing with both hands, punishing me violently. I was, I was less aghast and frightened than I was sickened. My disgust overwhelmed me. I ran from Auntie and her fierce blows, not out of terror, but out of loathing, which is disgust. I had learned another lesson. There are those in this world whose, quote, love, love is not only a wicked lie, but is a cover for unpardonable, unpardonable vindictiveness, a secret desire to cause pain, a sadism. There are those who are not to be trusted for a single moment, for they are innately malignant as well as hypocritical. They are the whited sepulchres of whom our Lord spoke with such anger and scorn. Give in to them for a moment, doubt that they are entirely evil, tolerantly admit they might be right in one thing, 
and they will fall upon you, believing your defenses are down and you have surrendered yourself as a victim. They love victims. I've got amen written out to the side of that in big green letters. When I arrived home in a somewhat disheveled condition, my mother, who was being visited by grandmother that day, asked me what had caused it all. I thrashed Tommy, I said. I knew better than to tell her why, so I added, he said a naughty word to me. Mama didn't believe in fighting, but grandmother laughed raucously at me and went. Always give it to them first, she said. Naughty word, you said, Janet. It was more than that, wasn't it? There was kind of an ESP between grandmother and myself, so I went back. I never went to see sweet auntie after that day, and I never cared for lemon cheese tarts again for the rest of my life. Years later, when I was a grown woman, she said to me sentimentally, We used to have such a jolly time in England, didn't we, love? I looked at her, and we both remembered clearly. No, I said, but you taught me something I shall never forget. Liberal that she was, she had helped to confirm my conservatism. That's the aunt that she said. No, you taught me something. Unctuous uncle. When we came to America, things were not much better among the dawning liberals here, nor among my relatives. I had an uncle who possessed a marvelous and soaring baritone, but alas, all he sang were hymns. There was a particularly juicy one which he favored, the chorus of which I remember when I am nauseated and decide to get the thing over with. We'll march, 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 and do our good. We'll march, march for brotherhood. How disgusting. I don't blame her for being nauseated at that. Unctuous uncle had a saintly look and bled for humanity. He always said so. One Sunday, and this must have tortured his thrif thrifty Scots soul, he invited my parents and my brother and me, myself, to have dinner with him and his new wife at a middle-class restaurant in a country village near the city where we lived. I was in pretty good spirits, having a secret hoard of five dollars from the purse of my grandmother for my birthday, so I decided that even Unctuous Uncle wasn't going to spoil everything with his hymns, which he sang all the way to the restaurant, his eyes big and noble and moist. The dinner cost nearly five dollars, a lot in those days. Afterward, Unky suggested that we all go out into the street, while he, he put it delicately, would manage the charges, that is, take care of the bill. But I went back to the restroom and emerged just in time to see my uncle's tall and handsome figure gliding furtively along the wall of the restaurant, slipping deftly into the street. I looked at the table. The bill was still there. And what did you expect anyway? That Uncle Unctious would refrain from robbing a poor waitress? Not dear liberal Unky, the blessed bleeder for his fellows. The girl anxiously came up and looked at the bill and exclaimed with horror, Your party went off without paying, and now they'll take it for my wages. I hesitated. The five dollars I had was my treasure, but the tears of the girl decided me, and I said, My uncle left me to pay the bill, and it's only four twenty-five, and keep the change. I shall never forget her joy. I joined the family party outside. Unky was well in the lead down the street, talking earnestly to Papa, the ladies bringing up the rear. I managed to get him alone half an hour later and frankly held out my hand. Five dollars, I said. I paid the dinner bill with my own money after you sneaked out. His holy face turned deep red. Then, sweet liberal that he was, he looked about him cautiously and said, If you are that big a fool, Janet, you'll get no money from me. The girl can afford to pay it or the management. My father came in, and I told him of the matter. She lies, said dear Unky in a bland and affectionate voice. You won't be surprised to learn that I received another thrashing. The thing that Unky was, the thing is that Unky was quite a rich man. He lies in an unmarked grave now. His wife was thrifty, too. <laughs> <laughs>